it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Azamat Umiralif. And he is going to talk about, I think, a very relevant topic that is overlooked so much. So are you solving a problem that actually makes sense? I know I've fallen into this trap and built something very cool, which nobody ever looked at again. So I'm very interested in hearing how we should go about this. Let's have a big round of applause. Thanks for the nice introduction, Lizana. Uh, indeed, I hope that uh, if you joined this talk, um, if you really liked the talk of Vincent from the morning, the keynote, and if parts of it resonated well with you, uh, I hope that you'll find uh, parts of this talk also interesting. Because at the end, uh, when he talked about how MLOps helps build models that last, um, I think that's really important to get right. But today, I also uh, want to talk about how to build models that actually build pro uh, solve problems. So um, that's kind of the, a bit of a takeaway. But let's start from the basics. Yes, this works. Um, so my name is Azamat, and I work at ING. Uh, it's probably familiar to some of you. Uh, but for those who don't know, it's an international bank. It operates in 10 retail markets and 40 wholesale uh, markets. And uh, I've been at ING for the last three years working on the app. So uh, this is the uh, login page of the app. Uh, there's quite a lot of different things that you can do, and data science powers uh, some of these features. So for instance, uh, we predict which transactions will come in. We uh, categorize the transactions that uh, have occurred. And we also personalize the uh, main page itself. So uh, I'm from the personalization team and uh, have been working there as a data scientist, as a product owner, and as a product data scientist. Um, so in my time at ING, I've put multiple models into production. Um, but if I look back at my time, and uh, I think if I asked my manager as well, he would agree that the most impact I had in the organization didn't come from actually uh, building those models. Um, I think the most valuable contributions that I've made uh, were a bit more vague, a bit more ephemeral. Uh, but there, there were usually instances where I helped the team identify new problems uh, to work on or to actually prevent models from going into production uh, because they weren't actually solving anything. Um, and I want to talk to you, I want to walk you through the framework that uh, I've come to um, use in my day to day. And uh, I hope that uh, it's something that you can take away as well. So this is the product development process. And it's probably familiar to uh, many of you, at least the questions that are on the slide. So usually we all start with the question of what is the problem, right? Is there a business need that needs to be done? Are the costs maybe too high? Um, is there a customer uh, problem that can be satisfied. And so once you feel a bit sure about the problem, you go to the stage of thinking, what is the solution? Right? How can we solve this problem? And that usually comes with a few extra questions. Uh, for instance, what is the interface? And here it can be both the UI, but more generally speaking, how do you kind of make sure that the information that you're producing gets to where it needs to be? And then also, what is the technical design? And that encompasses both the model design, but also the software engineering aspects of it. Is it running properly? Is it available? Uh, and is it performant enough? And then at the end of it, you have the step where you try to actually ask yourself, is the solution that we developed solving the original problem? And that's a very important part of this chain, because on every single of the previous questions, you make assumptions. Because we can't know for sure if the problem is 100% there or the interface is 100% available and reliable. So usually, um, you have to make some assumptions to uh, make some progress. But the validation step only happens once every time you go through the entire cycle. So there's a bit of a disbalance there. And to make things worse, um, a lot of these assumptions essentially tie into together, but they're not made by a single person. So if you have a product manager on your team, if you have a UX designer on your team, and if you have a software engineer on your team, they all make those different assumptions, uh, but they're all responsible for only some of the questions that you deal with. So that adds to the complexity and increases the fact that something gets lost in translation or you make decisions based on incomplete information. 
And I think that's where um, our role as data scientists come in. So if you're more of a machine learning engineer, uh, you obviously think about what is the model to build um, and uh, how do we put it into production, how do we make sure it runs. But I think it's also your responsibility to look at is this actually solving the problem we originally were intending to solve? And therefore, this validation part is um, probably part of your, or should be part of your responsibilities if it isn't. And then the other profile that we have, and that's the one I more closely associate with, is a product data scientist. So there, you don't focus as much on building the models, but you really want to make sure that uh, you answer this question, you help the team validate faster and more reliably, and I think oftentimes you also think with the product manager or whoever, other, uh, whoever else is responsible for the business decisions about what is the problem that we should be solving. And um, in my talk today, I want to walk you through the things that you can do to improve your chances of building something that uh, users want or something that solves an actual business need. And um, some of the things include um, pretty basic stuff like talking to your customers. Um, that's not necessarily your responsibility as a data scientist, but I think you should make sure that at least someone in your team is doing this. Another thing is doing market research and expert advice. So an example would be, uh, since we work in the personalization team, uh, we need to get feedback back from customers about whether they like the content we show to them or not. And we could have gone through the entire cycle and thought of the problem, thought of the solution, do all of the stuff. But uh, in practice, what we did instead was just look, OK, what are the other apps that are kind of similar to the app that we have? Uh, which of them also show content, and how do they solve this problem, right? So we did a bit of market research, and that helped us already get up to speed. Another thing is that you can have experts that you talk to, so if you know people that already solved problems similar to yours, then I think it's generally also good to try to seek out uh, advice from them. But then the next three things are something that you really should and can only do as a data scientist, and the first of them is cycling through uh, this entire chain faster, building early MVPs and releasing as early as, pos as possible. Another thing is to make very specific hypotheses before you set up experiments. And the last thing is to find validation evidence in the data even before you start building anything or uh, putting anything into production. So these are the things that you should do as a data scientist, and I'll walk through uh, each of them in a bit more detail with some specific examples. So first of all, cycling through faster. Um, and why we need to build MVPs and launch MVPs as early as possible. Um, I'll, talk, uh, I'll walk you through two different cases which I've worked on during my time at ING, and both of them had a very, very different uh, length of this uh, MVP cycle. So in the first project, it took us uh, two months to launch our MVP, and in the second project, it took us only one week to launch the MVP. And I'll talk about uh, why that, uh, what were the uh, outcomes of that difference. So first of all, uh, let's start with the case on the social ads optimization. Um, back in 2020, uh, when COVID started, the cost of ads, of social ads started to increase because everything moved to online, everything became e-commerce, so uh, there was much more demand for uh, social advertising, and at ING we also noticed this, and we wanted to figure out how can we decrease that cost. So the problem was clear, um, and it was more on the business side. And then the next step was to think about the solution, and we thought that, okay, so we select some customers and we push them to the uh, systems of Facebook and Google to target, but if we pre-select some customers and filter out the ones that we really know don't have a propensity to buy any of our products. In that sense, we would uh, decrease the cost because we target fewer people. So that's the solution that we thought about. Uh, and we thought about uh, building a model for this. The interface to use was an Excel with the customer IDs that we share to the agency. So uh, ING has a uh, partnership with some agencies that handles all of this, uh, putting the um, IDs and the bits into the, into the systems. And uh, the, int the communication with them happens through this Excel that's shared every, uh, every few weeks. On the technical design, we thought that, okay, so 
We want to test whether we can do something, so let's not overcomplicate things, and let's just build a linear regression on the GCP environment that we have and uh, use the model outputs to um, create the solution. So that's all nice, but uh, because we're working on GCP and uh, because in a uh, banking environment there's quite a lot of um, kind of we try to be very careful with the data. So uh, exporting from GCP takes some time, all of these kind of things. Uh, all in all, it took us two months to build the MVP and go through the cycle. And unfortunately, um, after those two months, we realized that no, the solution that we built isn't solving the original problem. And then we started digging, so was it the model performance or was it something else in this entire chain? So we tried to answer the question of why did it fail, and then we figure out that the interface was actually uh, incorrect. So um, even though we uh, gave those customer IDs to the agency, the agency could only match 10% of those IDs and therefore um, kind of any improvement that we had was, divi was divided by 10 and so we didn't really see the signal in the experiment. So the interface was invalid, uh, but it took us two months to realize this. So what should have happened instead? So if instead of building a linear regression on GCP, we would just have made a back of the envelope calculation about which products have the highest cross buy with uh, the other products that we offer and uh, just make this kind of calculation for every single customer, which you can do on, I mean, just uh, via a simple SQL interface, that would have been enough, right? That should have been our MVP. And then we would have launched this thing within one week and we would have found out that the interface doesn't work uh, much, much earlier. Um, so this was a case where it took us two months to realize that a very basic uh, assumption in that chain was wrong. The other case is a, uh, uh, happens two years later. Uh, after, after I've worked on multiple projects, I started working on the login intent prediction model. And there, um, I tried to extrapolate and bring with me some of the learnings from the previous project. So the problem was that uh, we have quite a few features in our uh, app, and customers use a lot of them. But not all are available at a single click away. So some features, like uh, predicting your future transactions, you need to click two or three times to get to that feature. So we thought that there's a customer problem of fast laning, right? So because some features are multiple clicks away, we thought that if we give them a shortcut and they can get to what they want to do uh, in just one click, that that's going to have a positive, exp um, positive effect on the customer experience. Um, so the solution we thought of was to predict which feature the customer will use when they log in and show them a shortcut um, about this feature. Um, having kind of uh, the learnings from the past, instead of uh, thinking of an interface where we build a completely new UI component and ship it to production and all of that stuff, um, I instead push the team to just reuse an existing component that we have. So here, the message that you see, that's the example of the shortcuts that we showed to uh, customers in the experiment. And uh, essentially, it's just uh, it's something that we set up literally within one hour because we just had to create the copy input and the hyperlink. Um, and then in terms of the technical design, so how would we predict uh, which feature the customers will use? We literally just ran an SQL query to find per customer what is the feature used the most. And uh, that was the feature for which we showed you the shortcut. Nothing fancy. It wasn't a model. We didn't train it on GCP. It was literally ju just an SQL query. And because of these uh, design decisions that we made, we were ready within one week. So within one week, customers were seeing this. I think around 10,000 customers saw this. Um, and we started to get um, data uh, to evaluate our experiment. Unfortunately, in this case, we also didn't uh, validate our problem because the, because the customers didn't end up using the shortcut. But after some deliberation and after some discussions, we realized that actually the problem isn't really there. So we really overestimated how bad is it for customers to have something two clicks away, especially because they're already very actively using that feature. Uh, but instead of abandoning this project, we got this learning and we thought, okay, so we should use this model um, or kind of this design to find customers that would be using this feature, but for whatever reason are coming to the app, 
and we should try to nudge them to use the app more uh, because we know that they would, for instance, use the kite fraud feature that predicts your future, tra future transactions. And the idea is now to reach out to them by email or the other channels that we have. So in this case, it only took us one week to get that learning. And um, I think it also then, even though the outcome was negative, it didn't really have any impact on the morale of the team, right? If you work on something for two months and then it doesn't really work, it has a different impact on the team than if you work only for one week, you did this experiment, and then you move on to the next thing. So that's one thing that you can do to um, validate your ideas faster. And uh, in my experience, this is one of the most impactful things that uh, you can do as a product team. So, um, I think as a data scientist, you should really push your team to ship things faster uh, because in data science, there's so much uncertainty about so many things. So is your model performing well? Is the inf interface correct? And the best thing that you can do is just to uh, cycle through this faster. However, that's not the only thing that you can do. So the other part is about making very specific hypotheses before you launch an experiment. And uh, I'll explain what I mean here on, a, on an example as well. Um, so as a product data scientist, you're responsible for this validation moment and figuring out if the solution is solving the problem. Uh, usually that happens by running experiments. Right? So you think of a metric that would capture whether the experiment is a success or not. That's how you know if the solution is solving the problem or not. Then you think of the experiment design. You define the experiment group, the control group. Um, you s do some power analyses to find the optimal duration of the experiment and the sample size. And once you went through all of these things, there's two outcomes, right? So either yes, you run the experiment, it's all nice. You know that your model or your feature is solving the problem it was intended to solve, or no. You don't see the uplift that you were expecting. Your A-B test is not conclusive, all of these things, right? If it's the first case and uh, you get the positive results, usually that's the end of the story. You move on, you productionalize, you improve the model, all that stuff. But if you didn't get the positive results, then the next step is thinking of what went wrong, right? Why did the experiment fail? And this is where... Um, making very specific hypotheses becomes important because if you just say, okay, we built this model that predicts um, customer intent, right? So we know why people came into the app and what they want to do, and so we expect them to click on that button more. If that's the way you phrase your hypothesis, then afterwards when it fails, you don't really have a clue of where to start looking for the reasons of that failure. But to avoid that, I would say you need to start with why. So move that question to the beginning of your chain. So before you launch an experiment, think of why do I expect this experiment to be a success? And coming back to the example of the login intent prediction, we could phrase it that uh, we expect a very specific CTR, so let's say 10% CTR on the shortcut because we thought that customers will uh, come to the feature via this path instead of the other path and that the CTR will increase over time because there is a bit of an ads blindness effect to that component that we reuse, right? So it's a very, very specific hypo hypothesis. And when we start with such a an hypothesis and go through this cycle and get a negative answer, we know what to check because we made the hypothesis very correct, very, very concrete, right? So we check, was the CTR actually 10%? Or was the um, proportion of the traffic to the feature uh, increasing through that shortcut, or uh, was the CTR increasing over time, right? So in our hypothesis, we had three specific points, and uh, because we defined them so concretely, we can check them afterwards. So um, again, in my experience, these kind of things, they really help to um, uh, make sure that your A-B tests are set up properly and that you don't have to restart and waste time because of that. Um, Finally, the last thing that you can do um, as a product data scientist is to find uh, validation evidence in past data, so before you launch any experiments. And that concerns more the part of thinking what is the problem. Uh, so in my experience, I work with our product leads and I help him on discovery. So part of my responsibility is to come up with new problems to solve. And uh, usually my workflow starts with making some 
um, idea about what could I find in the data, and then just go and look for it. So again, I'll try to explain on an example so, so that it's more clear. Um, we, um, because we work in personalization, uh, we work with multiple channels because customers are present on, uh, not just in the app, but a lot of customers use email uh, to interact with the messages we sent them or with chat. And the hypothesis that we had was that um, some customers have a channel they prefer. And so um, when we show them some recommendations, maybe we should show them through one channel and not through another channel. And so my hypothesis was that if we look into the data, we will find some customers that use the email more, but the app not as much, and then the other way around. So they respond to our messages in the app a lot, but not in email. So I had the simple hypothesis, then I started looking into the data, and then I found this. Right, so as you, on aggregate, as customers use the email channel more, they also tend to use the app channel more. And I could have stopped there and could have come back to our product lead and said no. So there's no evidence of customers having a preferred channel. We shouldn't proceed with this. Let's just uh, drop this and move on to the next project. But I had a bit of an intuition that personally, I felt like I fell into a bucket that really prefers to be contacted via the app. Like I'm really annoyed when anything uh, commercial or anything about the new features that uh, ING or any other company launch, I really don't like those emails. My email is the sanctuary where it's kind of like my to-do list, all of that stuff. So I was kind of confused that we don't see this. So I decided to dig in a bit deeper. And uh, my thought was that probably there's a bit of an aggregation effect. And we need to first separate uh, the customers into more self-similar clusters. So um, the next thing I did was I took all of our customers and uh, just with a k-means clustered uh, based on the customer features that we have. So for uh, simplicity's sake, let's think there's the number of transactions that you do in a year and the total assets that you own. So if we use those two features, we can get uh, quite clear clusters of customers. Um, so again, we have the same question, right? Do customers have a channel that they prefer to be contacted through? And now that we have those clusters, I can run the same calculation, and I found the evidence that I was looking for. So the majority of customers, as they use the email channel more, they also use the app channel more, so it's the big orange cluster. But then there are two smaller, smaller cl clusters that did show uh, signs of channel preference. So um, then, kind of looking at this, it was a very different story from what I saw before, and I couldn't have come to this without using a bit more of advanced techniques for, uh, for the analysis. And uh, I think I also see sometimes data scientists shying away from these kind of analyses because they think that, oh, a data analyst can do this because it's just, uh, no, you don't need a model to run, the, to run this. But I think what data scientists don't often realize is that to any analysis, there's many layers of complexity. You can go as deep as you want, and sometimes you do need a bit of a different skill set to come to the conclusions that will help your team uh, work on features and work on problems that are um, actually worth solving. So here, in this case, we uh, concluded that yes, there are signs of channel preference, and we proceeded to uh, uh, working on this problem. Um, so my key takeaways for you today are very simple. Um, and nothing there is related to ML ops. Uh, first, I would say that be conscious of the fact that you make assumptions on every single step of your product development process. And be conscious of the fact that we don't validate them as often as we should be. So validate all of these assumptions and just be conscious of that. Um, another um, thing that I would advise you to do is just to launch stuff early because done imperfectly is way better than done late. Um, I think there's, we don't realize this, but there's an opportunity cost uh, to working on certain problems. And if you spend two months on something that really doesn't make sense, it can have uh, compounding effects in the future. So just try to launch as early as possible, but at the same time, try to be a bit conscious of what you're testing, right? So make very specific hypotheses before you uh, launch anything to production. And finally, don't look down on some types of work, right? I think as data scientists, sometimes we think, okay, we're, we're trained in math and statistics and computer science. We have all of this knowledge about, you know, how to do regularization or transfer learning. So we should be spending most of our time on building models. 
or then also on uh, making sure those models run in production. Those are important things, but there's also sometimes the less fancy stuff, like doing an analysis or just stepping back, thinking about the problem, chatting with some people, maybe chatting with customers. So don't uh, shy away from those things and try to use your skill set and your tool set for things other than model building. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, you can connect to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and if you like the slides, uh, you can find them on the GitHub repo. Um, that's it for my talk. So thanks a lot for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions.